Start with a little uh, pop quiz. How many of the 12 disciples or apostles can you name? Barney? <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've got Peter, Andrew, James, John, Bartholomew, Nathan, no, Judas, Thomas, I, I, I don't know, okay. James, couple James, Nathaniel and Thaddeus are the same, yeah. Okay. Anyway, work, work on that, okay? The 12, you know, these, these are pretty important guys, right? I mean, these are the 12 men, according to the book of Acts, these are the 12 men who changed the world. And it's probably good for us to be able to identify who those 12 men are, who, who they were. Okay, second question is this. How many of the 72 disciples can you name? Gloria? No, that's the right answer. There, we, we do not know any of their names. Uh, Luke 10, 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Now, some versions will say 70, but most 72. And he sent them ahead of them in pairs to every town and place where he was about to go. Who are those 72 people? We can't even name one of them. Oh, we can speculate. Lots of people like to speculate as to who they might be. Uh, some of them certainly could have been women, maybe even the, the women who went to Jesus' tomb on Easter Sunday. Yet nowhere are we given a name or any information, personal information, about any of these other 72 disciples of Jesus. So it's possible one day in heaven I'll run into a fellow named Joe and he'll say, hey, I, I was one of the 72. And of course, I won't know whether he's telling the truth or not, but in heaven, everyone tells the truth. So he, he will have been one of them. For now, however, this is a group of unknown, anonymous disciples. And, and folks, I think this is another great example of how the Lord uses ordinary people. You know, I, I fear many folks think God is primarily interested in spiritual superstars. Uh, they, they assume like that God is kind of like an, an NFL scout who goes to a college football game because he's interested in one player. Out of the hundred out there, he just cares about one, the one who's the superstar. But, but God's not like that. He's not interested in superstars. A song from a few years ago uh, says, God uses ordinary people, ordinary people just like you and me. Actually, when Jesus chose the 12 disciples, they, they were pretty much ordinary guys. They, they weren't rich or, or famous. They, they were not the intellectual or religious elite of that day. Most of them were fishermen by trade. Here Jesus chooses an even more ordinary group. He chooses people whose names are not even recorded. And I suspect they were folks with many of the same limitations, fears, and frustrations that those of us in this room have. They were ordinary people, just like us or I should say like most of us, I, there are a few extraordinary folks uh, among us this morning, but they were ordinary. Well, friends, today our text is those first four chapters, I'm sorry, first four verses of Luke chapter 10. We're continuing our journey through the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10, 1 through 4. Go ahead and turn there in your Bible. If you're going to use the black one on the rack, it's page 868. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. 
and we, we will explore some of the things Jesus says <coughs> excuse me <coughs> to the 72 ordinary disciples he sends out and as we do I believe we'll find a message for ordinary followers of Jesus in this room uh, today uh, and for any extraordinary ones as well but let, let's pause and pray the Lord would use his word and his spirit to encourage each of us this morning thank you Father God for the Bible for the Word of God the truth it contains we ask that today Lord you would speak to us through it and that your spirit would enable us to hear understand believe obey your word in Jesus name amen as we go through this uh, short passage I, I'm going to point out four different things that I think we should remember uh, the first one is simply that ordinary disciples and again people who follow Jesus ordinary people who believe in Jesus try to follow him or ordinary disciples have important work to do we go to verse 2. He, uh, Jesus, told them, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. This is a, a farming analogy, gra grain farming. The harvest is abundant, or, or some versions say plentiful. Uh, the, the, the heads of the grain are full. It, it's time for the harvest. However, there are not enough workers to harvest the crop. That's a problem. Uh, Nancy has a couple of brothers who do a lot of grain farming by, by Crookston in the Red River Valley. And, and it's real frustrating because sometimes the weather will keep them from harvesting the crop. But, but they always are make sure they have plenty of workers. In this case, there aren't enough. And yet, <laughs> because the harvest is abundant, it is a wonderful opportunity for those willing to take it. Of course, Jesus is not talking about wheat here or corn. He's talking about people. And what he's saying is that there are people ready to hear the gospel. There are people ready to respond to the great news that salvation and hope are found in Jesus Christ. Friends, that's a reason for us as Christians to be optimistic and encouraged as we do our work of telling others about Jesus. The Lord assures us that there are people who will respond positively to this message. Let, let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that uh, this summer you decide to take a fishing trip to Canada and you hire this guide named Joe. Joe shows up in a lot of stories here, okay? And uh, Joe says, okay, well, th there's a couple of lakes we can go to, to, to go fishing. Uh, I've never been to the first one. I, I don't know anything about it. I, I, I think it's really a nice place, but I don't know what, if there's fish there or not. He says, the second one, I've, I've fished many times. And I've always had success there. It's well stocked with walleyes. Sometimes it seems like the fish are practically jumping into the boat. So which lake do you want to go? The first one, which I know, I don't know if there's any fish there at all. Or, or do you want to go to the one where I, I know there's fish? Well, I suspect most, if not all, of you would say, let's go to the second one. Let's want, go to the one where we know there are fish. Friends, the Lord says to us, as Jesus' followers, as his disciples, you're fishers of men, and I'm sending you out into a world which is well stocked with people ready to hear about Jesus. Now, how does God know this? Well, because, number one, he's God. He, he knows everything. He, he knows who will respond to the gospel and who will not. But the Bible also tells us there's a, a bit more involved. One reason God knows people will respond to the gospel is because he is at work. He, he's using all sorts of, of different means and circumstances to cultivate people's hearts and make them hungry for the good news. 
the 72 disciples are, are sent to prepare people uh, for Jesus, and yet God has already gone ahead and is preparing people for the disciples. That's why the harvest is already abundant. Friends, the same thing's true today. God's at work. Right now, he's getting people ready. He, he's softening uh, their hearts. He's opening spiritual eyes so that they will respond positively when ordinary disciples like us share with them the great news of Jesus. So whether you're going to North Africa like the Clays to tell people who have never heard of Jesus, or you're going to school uh, to talk to your friends who, who, who don't understand, they've heard about Jesus, but they don't understand who he really is, or maybe you're going to a family reunion full of people who believe about Jesus, but they're not really trusting him. Whatever the context is, God is at work. And if the Lord calls you to share the gospel with people, you can be confident that he will work in their lives. He'll help them to be ready to hear the great news that we have to share. Friend, if we are faithful ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our efforts to represent him and tell others the great news will not be in vain. Now, this does not mean that we will see quick or frequent results always. In fact, we may not see any results at all. That doesn't mean, however, that the seeds we plant will not eventually bear fruit. I love the story of, of Luke Short. Luke Short. He was a man who lived in uh, colonial Massachusetts, uh, 1700s, and he lived to be 100 years old. Not very common in the colonial days, but he lived to be 100 years old. At age 98, two years before he died, at age 98, he was reflecting on a sermon he had heard the Puritan preacher John Flavel preach 85 years earlier back in Dartmouth, England. 85 years earlier. At the time, Flavel's message had made Luke Short really angry. But now, 85 years later, it causes him to repent, to turn to the Lord and receive Jesus Christ as his Savior. It took some time for that seed to grow. And it may take some time for our seeds to grow, but the harvest will occur. The Lord will use our efforts to help others experience God's grace and find eternal life. Folks, that's a privilege that we as ordinary disciples have. Secondly, I would note that Jesus says ordinary disciples like us need to be praying. We need to pray for more disciples who can be his ambassadors. Again, verse 2 says the harvest is ready, but, but the workers are few. And so, yes, the 72 disciples, they, they have work to do. They need to go out there and, and, and tell others about Jesus. But they also have another responsibility because it's not enough for just them to do the work. They, they need help. They need to the help. Yet rather than going around door to door and, and knocking and, and saying, hey, uh, you know, can you help us today? We, we, we need some more workers. Jesus says, don't do that. Instead, ask God to do the recruiting. Ask God to send more workers into the field. Now, does this mean that it's wrong for me as a pastor to go up to you and say, hey, Barney, will you help do this at church? No, it's not wrong to do that. But even before I do that, I should be praying, Lord, work, work, prepare, equip, encourage others to be faithful disciples who are willing to be ambassadors for Jesus in our world. Pray that God would raise up workers. 
because we live in a world where many workers are needed. There are over 7 billion people on the planet right now. Some say 7.5 billion. And as far as we know, about 29% of these, or over 2 billion people, have never heard of Jesus. And they have no contact with any church or any Christians, at least as far as we know. There are about 400,000, 400,000 uh, cross-cultural missionaries, people like, like the Clays, uh, going to share the good news of Jesus with others. Unfortunately, only 7,000 of them are seeking to bring the gospel to unreached people, to those who have never heard. And that's what Chris and Steph are doing. They're, they're going to be 7,002 now who will be doing that. And, and that means there's about one missionary for every 290,000 people who have never heard about Jesus and apparently have no way of hearing about Jesus unless someone goes and tells them. One person for every 290,000 people. I think Jesus would still say the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Pray, pray that God would raise up more men and women who are willing to go to places where folks have never heard about Jesus. And here at Chisholm Baptist, we are very grateful the Lord has called Chris and Steph to go to North Africa to share the gospel there with folks, again, who don't know anything about Jesus and what he's done. We need to continue to work uh, supporting them in, in that endeavor. And we need to pray that God would raise up other workers, maybe even from our own midst, who will invest their lives in bringing the great news of Jesus to people that have never had the opportunity to hear what Jesus has done for them. Of course, there are many folks in our own community here on the Iron Range who are not believers in Christ. And though they have opportunities to hear about Jesus, most only have a fuzzy idea of what Christianity is all about. And as Christians, uh, the Apostle Paul says, we are Christ's ambassadors. We are, we are called to represent him and, and share the gospel with people around us. And we need to do that. And we should also pray that the Lord would help other Christians realize that they too have a responsibility to tell people they know the great news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Surveys sh show that, that most people who identify themselves as evangelical Christians, most people who would say, well, yeah, I'm a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, over 60% of them, over 60% would say they seldom, if ever, talk about their faith in Christ with someone who's not a believer. They seldom, if ever, talk about their faith in Christ with someone who's not a believer. These folks seldom, if ever, invite others to church with them. If you're a person and you say, yeah, well, that's me, Pastor Dan. I, I never talk about my faith with other people. You're not weird, okay? That's what most people do. <laughs> but it's not good. It's not good. Now, I'm not saying we need to be going door to door like Jehovah's Witnesses or, 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 or standing on a street corner telling people, you better repent. No, that's not what we need. But what we do need is all believers in Jesus, including those of us in this room, talking to our family members and our friends uh, the people we work with, the people we go to school with, uh, neighbors. That we need to talk to the people we know and tell them about Jesus and what it means to trust and follow him. And then we should be praying that, that all genuine Christians would recognize that this is our responsibility and that by God's grace we will do it. Frankly, I, I don't always remember to pray about that. I, I often forget to pray that God please raise up workers 
who, who will help with the harvest, both in our own community and, and in other parts of the world, especially in those parts where, where no one has even heard of Jesus. And uh, as I've been studying this passage the last couple of weeks, God has reminded me, and you need to be praying. You need to be praying that God would raise up those workers. Some of them would be, you know, what we call full-time professionals. Some of them are just ordinary people working, you know, 40-hour weeks, but they still need to be telling others about Jesus. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Okay, number three, Jesus reminds us that being an ordinary disciple, being a follower of Jesus, is not always easy. Verse 3, now go. I I'm sending you out like lambs among the wolves. Friends, you don't know, you don't need to know a whole lot about how animals relate to each other to know it's not easy to be a lamb among the wolves. Uh, folks, the, the Lord doesn't want us to be under the illusion that following Jesus is going to always be smooth sailing. There will be opposition. So, sometimes the, the opposition will be real obvious. Uh, uh, th there may be persecution. Uh, uh, some of Jesus' followers may be arrested, beaten, and even killed. That's happened that many times in history. It's happening in many parts of the world today. It's estimated that 245 million Christians this morning live in places where they face a high level of persecution. In, in most Muslim-dominated countries, in, in communist countries like North Korea and China, in, in, in predominantly Hindu countries, uh, such as India, it can be very dangerous to trust and follow Jesus. In fact, last year, over 3,000 Christians around the world were, were executed, were killed because of their faith. And that many, many others were beaten or, or imprisoned. And, and missionaries have been forced to leave places like, like China and India in recent years because of that, that threat of violence. Yet other times, uh, the wolves, well, they're not really the violent type. And instead, they will scoff and, and ridicule or, or simply avoid followers of Jesus. That's the type of opposition most common in our country. Now, most of us in this room have not experienced violent persecution at all, nor have we even received a whole lot of ridicule from those opposed to Christianity. Uh, often there are times there seems to be kind of a, a peaceful coexistence between the wolves and, and the sheep. Our, our culture has produced a lot of domesticated wolves, tame wolves. E and even though they're not believers in Jesus, these folks still tend to respect Christianity, maybe even admire people who are Christians. And so they don't, they don't persecute anyone. And then, of course, some of the, the sheep try to blend in with the wolves. These are Christians whose values and attitudes really aren't much different than the non-Christians around them, and thus they don't experience a lot of conflict with people who are not believers in Christ. However, things are changing. The wolves in our society are becoming less tame. More and more people have no use for Christianity and no use for Christians. Uh, they often see us as negative, judgmental people who are a threat to their lifestyle, and, and some see Christianity as the big obstacle to real progress in the world. Well, friends, in this type of environment, it's not much fun to be lambs among the wolves. It's not always going to be fun to be an ordinary disciple of Jesus. Which leads us to number four, that even in this hostile environment, the Lord instructs us as ordinary disciples to continue to trust him and to get to work. <laughs> Pretty simple instructions. Trust the Lord, get to work. Or let me read verse 4. Don't carry a money bag, traveling bag, or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. On the surface, those seem like strange instructions, but they're very similar to what Jesus told the 12 back in chapter 9. And these instructions not to carry the money bag, traveling bag, or sandals, it involves an expectation that when you go to these different villages, people there 
are going to help you out. They're going to give you money if you need it. They're going to give you uh, things to eat. That is how the Lord is going to meet your needs through other believers willing to share with those laboring in the harvest. And yet these instructions also point to the importance of trusting the Lord. You know, I, I'm kind of this way. A, a few of you I know are a little more this way. But w when we go on a trip, as we prepare to go on a trip, we pack. And we attempt to prepare for almost any contingency. We put all sorts of things in, in the suitcase, uh, some, in the second suitcase, just in case we might need those things. You know, in case an asteroid hits or something, you know, we'll be, we'll be prepared. In fact, that, that's the way that some of us live our lives. We're, we're, we're trying to prepare for every contingency, ready for every situation. Now, in general, planning and preparing are good things, okay? The Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs, <laughs> says, yeah, you need to be planning. However, like many other good things, planning and preparation can become idols in our lives. And especially in our culture, where some of us are really good at planning and preparing, it can be easy for us to place our confidence in our own ability to plan and prepare rather than in the Lord. In other words, our trust, our faith, is, is really in ourselves rather than in God. That's not how it's supposed to be, at least not for Jesus' disciples. Yeah, we should plan and prepare, but our ultimate confidence always needs to be in the Lord. It is, uh, if, if it is, then we are going to view our plans and preparations the way the Lord says we should in James chapter 4. Listen to verses, uh, James 4, 13 through 16. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow... We will travel to such and such a city and, and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For, for you're like a smoke that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Friends, those are words for all people, but they are especially good words for 21st century Americans uh, that we need to heed, including those of us who are followers of Jesus. Yes, we should utilize all, all the resources God provides for us. It would be foolish not to, but our confidence should not be in those resources or in ourselves. Rather, our confidence needs to be in the Lord. So, folks, that's what God has to say to ordinary followers of Jesus, both in the first century and 21st century. Uh, one more thing that I want to say. As ordinary disciples, we need to remember that trusting and following Jesus is a great privilege. It's the greatest privilege in the world. Whether or not people know your name is not really important. Whether or not your gifts and talents are, are recognized by others is not what really matters. Whether you think that, that you've been successful or, or significant in, in your ministry, that's not even that important. What really matters is that you know you're trusting in Jesus Christ and have been adopted as his child, as a child of God. And friend, if for whatever reason you're not sure what that means or not sure you're doing that, please make sure to talk to myself, talk to Pastor Ron after the service to know that, yes, I am trusting in Jesus Christ. I do belong to God. I am his child. Because nothing matters more than that. And when you have that confidence, that when you have that confidence that you truly belong to God, then you can let your soul be filled with gratitude for, for his amazing grace, and you can ponder what a great privilege it is to follow Jesus and be his disciple. Because in reality, there is, 
there's no such thing as an ordinary disciple of Jesus Christ. Anyone who follows him is living the most extraordinary life one can imagine. Following Jesus. No, it's not always an easy life. It's not always fun. It may not always be exciting. But it is the best path to take because it is the road that leads to eternal life and the road that leads to eternal joy. That's why we want to be following Jesus every day.